Tinder is a transformative technology. And it's radically underestimated yeah. in terms of its potency because it produces hyper successful predatory males and reduces rejection. It eliminates rejection because, I mean, you can be totally rejected, in which case you're a failure on Tinder. But in normal pre-mating interaction, let's say, there's a high probability of rejection, especially on the part of males. And that technology- Well, there's actually research on this. Yes. There on Tinder. Uh, yes. Uh, so there's there's research basically showing that so on Tinder uh, women are they they like you know swipe right they like the profiles of only four percent of the men that they right. see on the app, whereas for for uh, men when they see female profiles they swipe right or like uh, more than sixty percent that's six zero sixty percent of the profiles they right. see. So that's really so worth concentrating on because that's a great example of hypergamy. Hmm. Right, so women mate across and up success hierarchies, and men right. mate across and down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so and the women like men who are about four years older, cross culturally. They like men who manifest signs of success, as well as being handsome mm -hmm. and personable and all of that. And mm -hmm. the reason for that, as far as I can tell, is that they're looking to e equalize the economic disparity that exists because women take a harder hit from sex and pregnancy than men. So they're looking right. to equalize that. And no wonder they're looking for someone who's competent. This is for long-term mating, who's competent and generous, right? You want both of those. So competence would be intelligence, general cognitive ability, and the markers that go along with that. They want conscientiousness or openness, as well as other desirable personality traits. And they want generosity honesty, right. all of those. But so they're looking for someone who can provide. Well, it's not because they're greedy, precisely. It's because, well, they're going to put themselves in a more vulnerable position if they have a child. And we know this because even affluent women who have a child by themselves or who get divorced tend to drop down the socioeconomic hierarchy a fair bit, which is, of course, why alimony payments and all of that are necessary. So this hypergamy means women are much more selective in their mating than Men are, and that's true cross-culturally, and it's not surprising because they pay a bigger price for sex. It's more dangerous for women because they can get pregnant, and it might be more dangerous emotionally as well. And I believe that would be a reflection of their higher levels of agreeableness and higher levels of negative emotionality. So women do put themselves at risk more, and that might be why there's such a intense debate about what constitutes con consent on campuses, despite these beliefs in polyamory and all of these things. But So anyways, on Tinder, as you said, women select 4% of the men. Yep. So that means- And I would imagine that 4% is very high up on what you're calling you know, the, the success hierarchy. I have a friend, a good looking guy. Uh, he was very active on Tinder for a while and he accumulated more than 20,000 matches on the app. 20,000? 20, 20,000. And he was so successful right. that Tinder mm. Uh, pinpointed him early on and uh, gave him all kinds of free perks and bonuses and lifted his radius restrictions, gave him the, the, the Tinder Gold app or whatever version of it, basically trying to You're entice kidding. him to continue Tinder to use that. the app. Yeah, that's yeah. A, they, they wanted to entice Jesus. him. This is so amazing. They, they never want you to leave. These are unbelievably pernicious and vicious broad scale social experiments that are far more potent than anything like government policy. Well, you know, I mean, he's in, oh. he's in Genghis Khan territory <laughs> with 20,000. I don't know if, I mean, he, was, it's really, if he slept it's with really, all 20,000. Yeah, well, Maybe my 10, suspicions are he tried. <laughs> and I, I know <laughs> he'll, that, he'll get a kick out of that. That records for, for like athletes, for example, and movie stars, there's some of yeah. the men have reportedly Will slept with thousands of women. Yes, Will Chamberlain. And um, there's others who, who are in the same category, but they're people. They're men who have women throwing themselves at them all the time, lining up for them. And, and I've read biographies of people who had that sort of thing happen as well. But that's very, not very the typical male experience. I no, have the typical male experience is all rejection. Nothing. Exactly. Right. They well, might so get a couple matches a week. Right, right. So well, so you see what's happening is that Tinder is one of the forces that's transforming monogamy into polygamy. And the problem yes. with polygamy is that it, it follows a Pareto distribution, like the distribution of wealth, is that some tiny minority of men get all the sexual opportunity and all the rest get virtually none. And that is a right. recipe for, for social instability. I mean, that... that sort of deregulation 
of of romantic relationships you know whereas in the past it was expected for you to have one partner and over time settle down whereas now it's a total free for all i mean there are aspects to this that a lot of people don't think about i mean i talk to young people so i have younger friends who who i talk to who are sort of very active on on the apps and in sort of the dating scene and they'll tell me things like it's it's even easier to cheat so in the past if you wanted to be unfaithful to your partner it was risky because you know essentially like you you had the same social circle you had the same friends everyone knew everyone else but now with the apps you can match with someone who is completely outside of your social reality outside of your partner's social reality you can have a very discreet rendezvous no one will ever know about this um ghosting has become more more common i don't know if you know about ghosting but it's no, basically where you're in a relationship with someone um and after you have sex you know once or however many times then you just vanish you never see that person again uh delete you know, delete them from your phone, block them on social media. You never have to see them again. And there's right. no so social cost real, to this. That's a real psychopathic conquest strategy. Yes. That, right. Yes. Because the psychopaths, it's, they tend to form relationships that are very um, predatory and then disappear. Mm -hmm. Because that way their reputations stay intact as long as they can continue to disappear. But I'm, I'm interested in what you had said before about whether this is actually sort of cultivating psychopathy in young people and young men, where, you know, in the in the past, you know, typically a psychopath would, would do that on their own. But now with the apps and the technology, removing all of the friction from, you know, breaking up with someone or having to communicate with someone that you no longer want to see them. I think a lot of people who who ghost others, they're not even thinking in those terms. They're not thinking, I want to maliciously hurt this person or I don't care about this person. It's just it's like, it's easy, you know, you press a few buttons on your smartphone, and you can move on to the next conquest. Um, and I think a lot of people wouldn't act that way. Otherwise, well, the question would be what happens to you after you do that four or five times, you know, let's say you're not particularly psychopathic to begin with. It's like you, 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 you learn what you practice. Hmm. And I would say, look, if if you're using people continually as a means to an end, and I think sex is probably the most effective way of doing that, then you're establishing a pattern of interaction between you and other people at perhaps the deepest possible level. And so if you do that repeatedly, first of all, you're not, you're certainly not engaging in anything that might be regarded as a, as a meaningful or deep relationship. Quite the contrary, you regard that as excess baggage. That's an impediment to your next conquest, so to speak. So how would that not I mean, it'd be, now you said there was research on Tinder. Has there been research on the relationship between the dark triad and these hyper successful men? Hmm. Well, I've seen research on dark triad and Tinder use. And, you know, people who are high on dark triad do tend to be more successful, accumulate more partners, uh, specifically whether, you know, this is related to, to gender and whether men are more successful or, or more likely to, to hurt others using these apps. I, I haven't seen anything on that. I have interestingly seen, um, I think this was from Pew, uh, where they uh, broke down the data by education level. And they asked people questions like, have you ever been harassed on this dating app? Have you ever met someone on a dating app who inflicted physical harm on you? Basically, the, the wide variety of negative experiences through using dating apps, and they found that people who are not college graduates were far more likely, the women were far more likely to report negative experiences on the dating apps compared to uh, college educated women. And to me, this is also indicative of this, you know, this sort of social class divide, um, another manifestation of the luxury belief of sexual promiscuity, where, you know, you introduce these dating apps, you have no idea what's going to happen or how this is going to warp society and how people are going to interact in romantic relationships. And it's disproportionately harming uh, lower educated, lower income women who are like you're saying, they're probably more likely to meet psychopaths. They're probably perhaps less adept in some ways at screening for certain kinds of guys. The other thing is, um, well, and especially I, I if they're only connected mothers. these. Because, right. Well, yeah, because yeah. It's, well, they're a lot more, they're a lot easier to prey upon. I mean, their straights are a lot more desperate and they've knocked themselves out of the single girl dating market and lowered their market value, so to speak. I hate to speak of it in terms like that, but it's clearly the case because to initiate a relationship with a woman who has a child already is to initiate a relationship that has a lot higher upfront cost. The complexity of negotiating the relationship with the child, the additional responsibility that has to be taken on instantly. And none of that's the least bit trivial. So 
So, right. so that means, and we know that in general, if you do a triangular, imagine a triangular representation of a social hierarchy on any valued dimension, the people who are at the lowest level are those who are most susceptible to any sort of uh, destructive tendency that comes whistling through. They don't have as much social support. They're a lot closer to abject poverty. They don't have the the broad social network or the opportunities. Um, so everything affects them disproportionately, including epidemic illnesses. And it's the case throughout the kingdom of life that low status confers vulnerability. Oh, that's why people go for higher status, at least in part. Yeah. So right. the the Tinder, I mean. I don't know how widespread Tinder use is. I don't know that much about Tinder, but when I first found out about it, I thought this is a technology that, well, they certainly named it properly because Tinder starts fires and it's a fire starter and not just 